This is a message from Anonymous and the people. Corrupt leaders of the world, we will not stand for your lives any longer. We the public, the 99% and Anonymous, now render you obsolete. Thank you, fuck off. Guys, welcome. This is Top Gear Live uh, and on UK radio. Uh, Sunday broadcast. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us back. Uh, we had a holiday last week uh, and Maz uh, covered for us. Uh, appreciation to the Maz. Now, uh, hosts, how are we doing? Pretty good. How are you? Outstanding. Outstanding. Gary. I can keep my cat from running in and out. We'll be great. We have a guest cat with us tonight, guys. <laughs> and her name is Ubasti, goddess of all cats. So there's that. <laughs> Ubasti. The Egyptian goddess of cats. Ah, very nice indeed. Do we have a gal with us as well? Yes, yes, yes. You have a gal. We have a gal. And we have a bad with us, I believe. I am also here too. All present and correct. Uh, nice work, guys. Um, we will, as I say, we'll get straight to it. Uh, there really is no point fucking hanging about. Now, um, we mentioned two guests uh, on our tweets uh, out for this uh, broadcast. Uh, we have Jay Liederman joining us. Jay? Hey, good afternoon. Or good, good evening. Or, you know, wherever anyone is, whatever it is. <laughs> uh, good morning in Australia. We've got some Australians tuning in for this show. <laughs> Good morning to those. Um, Jay, welcome back. It's, uh, it's a real honour to have you back with us. Uh, how's things? Things are really good. Things are really good. Rolling right along. Pretty busy these days. Trying to get some things sewed up. Um, you know, there's always a lot going on in the Anon world uh, criminally in, Cal- in, uh, in the United States because, you know, that's what they do. And I imagine we'll, we'll talk... Uh, some some degree about that today and um you know things are good on uh things are good on all fronts uh real good to hear mate and yeah absolutely we will get into uh what uh, as you say you've been a highly busy it's uh uh people knocking your door down i'd imagine at the minute yeah well yeah something like that (laughs) Something exactly like that, yeah. <laughs> um, we In our tweets, we mentioned a second uh, guest with us, and this is who Jay Liedman is uh, currently representing, and that's Barrett Brown. Good evening, Barrett. Good evening. Uh, good, good evening to you, and congratulations on your second release. Oh, thank you very much. It was, uh, it was better than the first. <laughs> I can uh, imagine. Um, if we, we'll get straight to it, Barrett. Uh, you were arrested, rearrested, uh, and detained again. Uh, do you want to give us some details on that? Yes. Uh, a few weeks ago, the Bureau of Prisons, uh, which runs the federal prison system in the U.S., uh, suddenly decided that I'm not allowed to give press interviews. So of course, I've been giving press interviews for this is you know during my incarceration, before the trial, and after trial, from the prisons uh, from. Halfway house afterwards, at the home front, very regularly. Uh, and I explained to them that no family of the group of Sorry, um, Barry, is there any way you can turn your mic up? And I believe, Jay, we're getting some feedback from you, some noise. Um, well, let me, let me mute while I'm not on. So, uh, <laughs> if it takes me a second to answer a question, just, uh, you know that I'm unmuting, okay? Yeah, no worries. We'll give you a prod. <laughs> Sorry, so, Barry. Uh, carry on. Yes, the, uh, so the Bureau of Prisons have made these claims, and they're clearly false. Uh, all of the press uh, policy for inmates is spelled out very clearly in a particular document called the BOP Media Contacts, 
uh, program statements, and I've linked to that in my article for the magazine, laying all this out about a week ago. Uh, so, I mean, what, what they were playing with was, was nonsense, and I told him that. He made some recordings of the BOP uh, representative who was trying to, who was threatening me with an infraction if I continued to do interviews. And uh, then they had the marshals arrest me for, and I was in there for four days, back at one of the jail units I've been uh, at prior. And eventually was released after some legal threats to the BOP. Uh, they were going to go to a judge challenging my confinement. They wouldn't have had anything to, uh, you know, there would have been no explanation for it. So they just released me on the uh, following Monday morning. And that's about where we are now. Uh, there's always the possibility that we'll go forward with some legal action. Uh, but what always interests me in these cases is does the U.S. press in particular to understand what's going on? In this case, they generally they really don't. I've had to really depend on foreign press to cover this, uh, with the exception of outlets that I write for, The Intercept, D Magazine, and a few others uh, have covered this. But, you know, this, this is, of all the things that have, that have gone on that I've tried to uh, sort of illustrate and kind of bring, make instructive lessons out of, this is the most sort of blatant, uh, unambiguous uh, instance of press freedom violation. It wasn't just my right to be violent. It was the rights of uh, everyone, including PBS and uh, Vice Television, who were trying to interview me and who were being, you know, who, who were whose rights of uh, you know were, were being violated uh, up until this up and now now they backed off the Bureau of Prisons Finland so you know it's always an adventure over here. Now th this has serious implications on uh, because this is your job uh, you're a journalist and if you're not allowed to speak with journalists uh, uh, you're not allowed to actually earn money uh, you've got restitution to pay if I understand correctly. Yeah, I owe about. Uh, Eight hundred thousand dollars to Stratfor, an intelligence contracting firm with ties to the government, and I owe uh, about sixty thousand altogether, uh, sixty thousand dollars to two other companies, one of which is sells uh, uh, militarized tear gas to the government of Bahrain to use against pro democracy protesters. The other one was a law firm that no longer exists, which uh, inspired the congressman and other uh, government officials to uh, do a runaround on a. Uh, there was a charges of uh, you know war crimes uh, being laid against this uh, military fellow when they were representing him. And, uh, anyway, Jeremy, Jeremy Hinman hacked both those firms, frankly for good reason. And I was you know that was all by restitution. So that's that's uh, another issue is, is how do I you know how am I supposed to pay all this money back you know if uh, if they're going to be interfering with my you know press work over and over again. Uh, so. You know. How does it feel having a, an eight hundred thousand dollar bill over your head? And is there uh, what, what's the uh, the motions for you to pay this? Uh, is there? A... So, it feels great. Uh, <laughs> it feels more because I mean that that money. They, there are certain obligations I have right now uh, to pay a small amount. You know, when I was in prison, I had to pay two hundred dollars a month to that uh, fund, and then thereafter, I'll have a percentage of my of all my income, uh, including this book deal I've signed. Uh, you know they'll go to that, but after uh, after my probation, my obligations are sort of diminished. There, there's, it's very difficult for them to go after you know my finances in any real regimented sense after that. And as I uh, announced on Russia Today last week, I do plan on leaving the U.S. anyway after my probation is over, probably about a year from now. So uh, you know, to the extent that I'm legally obligated to pay some degree of my money to these criminal companies, I will do so, but I'll also take advantage of that to uh, continue to bring attention to what those companies were doing and what it says about the United States. Well, that's how uh, I first crossed your path, uh, you probably don't remember, but uh, we had a conversation in Tiny Chat uh, relating to Project PM. Uh, you was crowdsourcing uh, the endeavour at the time. Uh, do you want to explain to uh, the guys uh, what uh, your involvement with Project PM was and what its uh, ultimate uh, endeavours undertook? Well, before I got involved in Anonymous, right around the time of the Tunisian Revolution, I created a group called Project PM, which was sort of an experimental. Uh, first, it was supposed to be a, a, sort of a new media platform, uh, disseminating information in a more uh, rigorous manner, and then it evolved, uh, as necessary, uh, into a crowdsourced uh, sort of investigation platform. Uh, going into the intelligence contracting uh, industry here in the U.S., documenting all the emails that uh, were stolen by Anonymous and other uh, related groups uh, over a couple year period that detailed these relationships between these very insidious private contractors and uh, 
Pentagon, intelligence community, uh, law enforcement community, the DOJ, State Department. Uh, so that was that was what that would became, and now uh, we all have that. We have all that information sort of documented on that echelon 2org site, which I think is a slightly different URL now. But uh, it, the, the the original thrust of what Project M uh, was is now uh, going into this other project, like the Pursuant System, which we have a group of uh, programmers. Uh, building right now, which you know, we'll talk about. My uh, answer to a lot of questions uh, uh, raised: of how, how do we go forward? How do we get people who are not even activists? Uh, how do we get them to take their citizenship seriously? And how do we uh, harness people's efforts, create create actual uh, cogent, formidable opposition uh, across the world? And uh, so that's that's what it's become, and that's always been up to my interest. I've just pasted um, the uh, the wiki. Yeah, you're right. Uh, it has changed. It's wiki dot project hyphen pm dot org. We've uh, yes, yeah. uh, just posted uh, just posted that. Um, to be honest, that was a far reaching um, undertaking uh, that you embarked on. Uh, I guess it was pretty almost a full time. Uh, job and you had a team uh, uh, supporting uh, you guys, and if I met, if there's still stories breaking from it today, if I understand correctly. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's there's still a lot to be gleaned from. First of all, the seventy thousand H.P. Gary emails that sort of uh, included communication between a number of companies, including Palantir and uh, a number of government agencies. There's still a lot to be found in there. Uh, we we kind of provided an overview of several of the projects. Uh, you know, and presented that, made it available to other journalists who might be interested in covering these issues, but who might not be familiar with the background. It was uh, it was really interesting as an experiment in crowd uh, unusual project. Uh, there's a lots of there's lots of sort of uh, little nuanced lessons to be gleaned from how that operated, what worked, what didn't. Uh, trying to kind of use those lessons uh, as we go forward and try to build something a little bit more comprehensive uh, out of crowdsourcing. Uh, bear with me a second. Uh, we have noise. Uh, so, Project. Uh, Sorry? I'm messing with you. It's what the good co host does. <laughs> guys, feel, uh, feel, hey, feel free hey, to jump hey in. Hey, guys, with any it's Jay. Uh, now may be a, a good time to jump in. There's a gentleman named Douglas Lucas who's really been, uh, for the past couple of years now, really heavily digging through both uh, Stratfor emails and, and what ended up being called, um, you know, the GI files on um, WikiLeaks. And, uh, you know, he's, he's got a nice resource on that and is kind of kind of combed it, collated and all of that. Having said that, let me get, let you guys get back to this fascinating discussion. <laughs> no worries. Thank you very much, uh, Jay. I was going to bring you in in a second anyway, because I've got a, uh, some important questions to ask you. Um, on on the uh, the legal support uh, of where Barrett is at the moment, um, the project uh, PM uh, ongoing uh, endeavor is that anyway related to your new project, Barrett? Well, um, project PM as such doesn't really exist anymore. Uh, we the, the, what we put together now involves largely different people, uh, people who are involved in the crypto community, programmers, uh, activists, people involved the Occupy Wall Street. I've got a team of about five uh, core. People who are building this this software uh, pursuance system. Now, the pursuance system is uh, more comprehensive, more ambitious than what we've done before. This is this is intended to provide a platform whereby all of these people who are out there, who are connected with each other for the first time in human history, can work together, uh, you know, with no prior relationship, and establish a meaningful sort of democratic uh, series of relationships. We call it process democracy. We call it the institutional democracy. And uh, create effective structures, entities uh, that can eventually uh, confront our criminalized institutions in ways that just aren't possible right now. Uh, this all, this is all based on this precept that look, I mean, we, we can we can discover whatever we can that we can hack and, and leak, and we can do open source information gathering, and we can present all these cases, but nothing really changes unless we have people able to act on that information. Right now, we, we can't depend on the institutional um, media establishment or, or even independent media to change to change these things. Uh, it's not enough to know 
we have to be able to present people the tools whereby they can uh, know that their actions will be meaningful, uh, that they will be able to, uh, you know, work together in, in a way that that is obvious to what governments do. We have to have a counter state. Uh, we have to have a counter state that does not uh, work under the dictates of statism. Uh, a counter state that uh, allows people to participate in something that they are morally uh, acceptable with, uh, something that. Uh, you know, it takes advantage of, of this key factor of the 21st century, which is that for the first time in history, any individual may now collaborate with any other individual on the planet. Uh, that's an extraordinary change uh, in, in our potential uh, human relationships, and it hasn't yet been explored. It hasn't, it's not quite understood uh, because there's so sort of much mundane uh, activity attributed to the Internet. It's hard for people to sort of wrap their minds around what this means. It'll become, It's becoming more evident now when we see so we've seen things like anonymous. We've seen WikiLeaks. We've seen what great potential there is. Good and ill. Uh, to sort of brought up using the internet to build up cults and some movements. Uh, we have to make sure that we're there first in taking the next step. We have to make sure that we are. Uh, and by we, I mean uh, anarchists, libertarian, uh, left, you know, left socialists, uh, people who are simply opposed to fascism or, or uh, reactionaryism or authoritarianism. Uh, we have to make sure that we are first in understanding these things and employing these new tactics and developing the tactics if necessary. This pursuant system provides the framework for doing that. Hey Barrett, this is Gear, and I've been um, I've been watching what the mainstream media has been doing to WikiLeaks. They've been labeling them things like intelligence porn and non-state intelligence service, often abetted by state actors like Russia. What are your thoughts on the uh, the way that they're really trying to demonize WikiLeaks even further than we've seen in the past? And what do you think the outcome is going to be? I mean, there's there's, a, there's always this there's a uh, perpetual change in WikiLeaks's constituency based on what WikiLeaks is doing, who it was affecting. Uh, we've seen we've seen a lot of people flip, flipping on their views of WikiLeaks over the years. Uh, we've seen people who were calling for Assange's assassination now praising him, and then going back to calling for assassination and on you know, again what he's doing week to week. Uh, that's very indicative not of WikiLeaks but of these institutions. Uh, there are just like any other institution, WikiLeaks is subject to reasonable criticisms and unreasonable criticisms. Uh, and the times as times change, you know, the the percentage of the unreasonable criticism will increase or decrease. Uh, I believe the intelligence point comment I think that was made by the our FBI had recently Yes, James Kelly. And uh, that's a silk term. It has no meaning. Uh, he, you know, this is head of the FBI. This is head of an organization that has been uh, the most dangerous, deleterious factor in, in U.S. democracy for 50 years or so. Uh, you know, as the CIA has declined in its sort of internal abilities, the FBI has never quite those, those uh, that reach uh, domestic. Uh, so, you know, he said this is sexual nonsense. Um, you know, we, 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 the people need uh, their own intelligence service, one that's not serving a state, but serving you know anyone who wants to know what states are doing. That would be the first step in that direction. Um, you know, it, it provides it's one of several entities over the last ten years to show us what can be done and, and how to do it. Uh, it's, it's something that we can glean lessons from. As we move forward and start creating more energies uh, along different lines, different experimental procedures, uh, and kind of figure out how do we how do we approach this as a as a world population? Uh, how do we determine the best ways to find out what's not we're not being told and find out what's being done in our name? And how do we uh, more importantly how do we counteract that? And uh, WikiLeaks is one uh, sort of set of lessons on that. Uh, there are others, and uh, again we're still very very early days. The information that can still ought to be uh, tried and, and, and uh, you know, pursued. A question for you, Baron. This is a personal question, and Jay, please jump in if. Uh... Uh, any question you deem uh, to be an issue uh, from a legal standpoint. Um, how did you personally feel knowing that 
uh, companies like Stratfor uh, were collecting information on activists uh, at the behest of banking institutions, and you still end up having to pay. Well, I mean, it's it's this is it just it's the same lesson we'd already kind of seen in beginning of 2011 when the H.P. Gary emails came out, the Team Themis uh, conspiracy was exposed. We've seen over and over again that. The U.S. governments and other governments like it uh, are essentially allied with banking and corporate uh, and private interests against other private actors. Uh, Bradford's a great example. They were uh, dealing with Coca-Cola, and the FBI was giving them files on, on activists and data. That's not how it's supposed to work, obviously. If you, if you and I go to the FBI and say, hey, we need help going after our enemies, they're not going to help you out. But if you're a corporation, then they're, I mean, they're, they'll give you files, not to give you, et cetera. Uh, we, we see that over and over again. Even when it's exposed, there are no consequences. So what that should tell everyone is that uh, it's open season on journalists and activists if, if you uh, are deemed to be uh, dangerous to the interests of not just the governments, but just powerful, private, wealthy people who have friends in governments. That's an extraordinarily terrible situation. And it, it goes to show that you know we have to uh, continue to fight back. We can't just, we're not going to get our rights by begging for them. We have to uh, reestablish those rights over time. That's going to take a period of conflict and a period of uh, confrontation uh, by which to help bring that issue more, uh, bring it clearly uh, in public view, make everyone understand what the actual situation is so that it can be acted upon. With this and I'll, I'll, I'll add to that, if, if I may, the, the initial question about um, restitution, which I kind of find to be a fascinating issue federally. Because it's mandated, um, you know, whatever you plead guilty to isn't isn't the end of the story. Your jail time isn't the end of the story. And, and one of the things, you know, not to get too deep into it, but one of the things is being branded a felon and, and um, you know, having whatever problems there are for, you know, for the average person getting a job and, and um, you know, voting or, or getting, you know, uh, government assistance or what have you. But I digress. Going back to the restitution, that's mandatory, and they make a determination really based on very sketchy factors provided by the company itself that you really have to try to challenge in depth to, um, you know, you know, to get it down. In uh, the, I think the last time I was on, I was on here. Um, top was uh, was right after Matthew Keys, maybe right after either the sentencing or the verdict and we talked about i think we talked about the fact that um the tribune company wanted almost a million dollars in restitution something like nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars and we were able to cut that down to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars which is by the way no small chunk of change and what happened you know what happened um there was as a as kind of a, a token of, of I don't it, you know Tribune Company was really taking it badly in the press over you know two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of loss when it was just a bunch of computer people responding. So what they did was they wouldn't waive the restitution. Of course, they're making they donated it to some uh, some type of uh, fund like journalistic funds just to rub it into keys. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, we haven't seen Stratford do that, you mm. know, um, Stratford is certainly not donating that money to the victims of the Bhopal disaster, Indeed. which Jeremy and, and Barry, you know, helped uncover the, the harassment going on there by Dow, you know, 30, 30 years later. I mean, they're certainly not donating the money there. They're looking to, you know, they're looking to pocket this money and, um, it's that's a real uh, that that's a real thing in federal sentencing that we fail to consider a lot of times when you know we're looking at just guilt or innocence. You know, obviously the primary thing is prison time, but you know there's also a life after prison that can be very difficult, especially when restitution's at hand. And I'll give you just one one more example it is um, uh, Royal Rivera from Lolsec and the Sony Pictures app the one from L.A., and he and uh, his co-defendant got, um, you know, got ordered to pay $605,000 worth of restitution, uh, what they call joint and severally, which I'm sure is, is what 
Barrett uh, was ordered to pay with Jeremy uh, on that. I think I think they were Barrett. You guys were the only two convicted of that, right? Uh, yes, yes. They're yeah. all together involved, but we're the only ones uh, convicted. Yes. Right. So, so the way that works, what Jointon severally means is that you know, for every dollar Barrett pays, Jeremy doesn't have to pay one. For every dollar Jeremy pays, Barrett doesn't have to pay one, and until it uh, until it works itself out. Um, so Rivera and his co-defendant were ordered to pay six hundred and five thousand dollars in restitution. Now, by the time we got him sentenced, Rivera was twenty-one. At the time of the crime, he was three weeks. It was three weeks after his eighteenth birthday. So, can you imagine starting out your life with a six hundred and five thousand dollar debt? You know, can you get can you get a credit card? Can you can you lease a new car? Can you can you ever think of a mortgage? You know, if you get married, you have kids. You know, can you can you think of like that? You know, this this so called American dream. You know, the the white picket fence in the suburbs. And can you even rent a house, Jay? I mean, can you even rent it, a place? You know, it's it's um it's out there on your credit report. That's a really good point. Uh, in that you know he's had a roommate situation. For a long time, uh, I've been talking about them, but I haven't been asking a lot of questions. Talking about them, I'm sorry. I've been talking to him, but I haven't been asking a lot of questions about that sort of thing right now. He was able, he was able after some time to get himself a, a pretty good job. He's going to be all right eventually, you know, maybe by the time he's 30, 35. But I think I'll be living in a roommate situation for quite some time. You know, other people aren't going to be so lucky. Uh, in, indeed, they're not. And uh, there, there's many activists uh, still still in prison today that are coming out to uh, uh, to face uh, that situation. Uh, Chelsea Manning is due to, for release very shortly, I understand. I, yes. I, I did want to ask uh, you, Barrett, as well, if, if I can... Uh, was you what information was you receiving when uh, you were incarcerated? Were, were you fully aware of uh, like the Snowden leaks um, uh, and other news items of, of interest as such? Because I know you was uh, in solitary confinement for uh, quite quite a while. Uh, yes, I mean even when I was in in the hole uh, for about six months of my four years in the hole altogether, you know I get uh, magazines, I get letters, people mention things. Uh, so I don't think there was anything big that I wasn't aware of pretty quickly. There's all these, all these little small issues that are actual important stories that had I been out, I would have been able to assess those. So, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of things I missed that were not news stories, but, but should have been, that normally I would have been pursuing. So that was uh, a problem. But on the other hand, again, there, there's just so little, there's really no point in, in, in journalism, frankly, uh, in a society like this. I mean, it, only very haphazardly, only rarely does bringing attention to things to make any difference whatsoever. That, that, that again, that's why we're emphasizing so much the, uh, the matter of sort of self-organization and the creating sort of new next generation uh, civic platforms. Uh, nothing will change uh, until there's um, some leadership that is provided uh, and until the framework is, is provided for people to take their citizenship back into their own hands. Uh, you, uh, we, we shared your writings uh, quite widely uh, amongst us, fellow hosts and uh, friends of ours. Uh, they, in the situation you was in, it was truly remarkable and highly inspirational. Was that like a coping mechanism for you? Uh, sure. Uh, I, mean, I, I know it, it, was, it was wonderful to, to have the, gov the U.S. government, DOJ in particular, suffer and lose credibility over my case. And every 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 little piece of that was was quite wonderful to me. I'm I'm someone with a great deal. I'm very vindictive towards the U.S. government. Uh, I'm very hostile to you know most of these government agencies. And so anything that allows me to sit around and by doing so sitting around in a cell hurts the government uh, is it, very nice to me. Very wonderful to me. Um, so no, it was, that was that was important. It's a very important step in all of this. Every time you know, obviously there's opportunity is provided. To, to deal that damage to the government's uh, credibility and it has to be taken. And, 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 just, and just doing that 
the spread the word of all these these incidents and these uh, these the government showing its true colors. That that's that's a very part of what we do. What's your uh, what's your feelings now uh, in the current climate with the current administration? Uh, do you think uh, journalism, uh, freedom of speech, is going to get worse? And how do you see yourself uh, uh, fitting into this? I know you're looking to um, uh, extrapolate yourself from uh, the country, but in the short to medium term, uh, where do you see things going? Well, I'll still be involved no matter where I am physically. That's the great thing about this age. I have to talk to work. But, uh, if, you know, in, in, in terms of, like, the general, like, where is where is history moving in this country? What is the tendency? Uh, you know, you can, you can look and see that the, the U.S. media is not able or willing to defend its own rights in any meaningful way. There will, there will be, you know, every time something happens, there will be some, some discussion and some articles and all that. But in terms of actually taking steps necessary, to, 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 the press will not do that. Having said that, all of these issues, I think, in this age, more than previous ages, are going to depend uh, on, on which way they move, on the actions of a few individuals here and there, uh, partly because this is an age in which an individual can be super empowered, uh, partly because our, our, the press in this country, in many countries, and the, sort of the national conversation is event driven. That's in a little event that uh, just happened to uh, occur. That's really what drives headlines and thus, you know, the attention of the public. So, and that's a problem. That you should be uh, data driven, not event driven. Uh, something is not more or less important because that little event happens to occur that you know people find interesting. But uh, that being what it is, it's very hard to predict uh, which way any of these issues will go. Uh, so much of it again. Well, for instance, how would the last ten years be different if really Assange had never existed? It, so. Again, that this is a period in which we don't know what to expect, but that that's the uh, uh, reassuring because it means that any individual uh, can wear and can see that they are not just one person, essentially. That they do have the ability, by virtue of this, this extraordinary new ability to uh, mass communication and mass collaboration, to put something in motion that does actually serve the patterns. And that, that's the most important thing in mind right now, that they're, you know, as over the next year or two, as we uh, and other groups start providing you these tools uh, to self-organize, uh, you know, you should keep that in mind. That should be the forefront of your of your civic thinking that that you do have the option to do something besides marching or your congressman or throwing a brick through a window. That there is there is a tendency that we put put in motion uh, for self-rule over time. I'd like to ask the same question to you, Jay. It'd be interesting to uh, hear uh, from a legal standpoint on this. Um, uh, the nature of um, activism and journalism uh, in itself and uh, the trampling of uh, the, is the First Amendment. Um, what's your thoughts? <laughs> Gosh, what a... <laughs> What, a, what, a, what an interesting question. Um, you know, from my perspective, uh, we're seeing really bad things happen to the First Amendment uh, all around the world. But, we're, you know, you don't expect, you know, just the way America talks about itself that we're supposed to be the worst. You know, but, but we are. Uh, and, and we have become, this last election cycle um, was the most horrible thing, you know, I've ever heard. Because facts have become facts that want that people want to believe. You know, journalism is sensationalism right now, and there is a disregard for the truth. So, you know, you have kind of this really interesting thing going on in, in America, where and it's it's totally the opposite of Europe, and it's where we're moving away from sort of defamation laws, slander, libel. Uh, the types of, of things like that to the point where you can be you can be countersued yourself for saying something about someone and that is you know that is supposed to be to enhance their free speech however what it does is it, it you know it essentially it eliminates the ability for people to tell you know for, for you to get the truth out there you know so people can say, whatever they want, as long as it's false right now. There are all kinds of protections for that. But for the truth, 
Um, you know, legally speaking, sure. I see it across my desk, you know, pretty regularly. You know, I, I still get all kinds of, of encrypted messages here and there. And flatly, I get a lot of, of email. So, you know, this is happening, that's happening. You know, can you help with this? Can you help with that? Um, and it's, um, I, I kind of think, I don't know, I don't want to coin another one of these stupid phrases about war on this and war on that, but I don't know another way to say it other than it's a war on truth. Um, you know, take, take Trump's uh, inauguration, right? There are two pictures taken from exactly the same point, eight years apart. Um, one is Obama with a, a full lawn. One is Trump with a, you know, a quarter full lawn. Yet those are, those are now called alternative facts. And, and people are interested in sensational lies and people aren't interested. Just to circle it back around to what Barrett said, people aren't interested in the data. They're, they're not. And that's a problem. And it's not a First Amendment problem. It's a, it's a problem with populism. It's, it's a problem with uh, really this global wave that's, that's you know, go, going where, you know, it's just uh, there, there's been a loss of fighting for rights you know, standing up to guard your rights, unless those rights are to be, you know, racist or horrible or, or you know, or to make more money as a corporation and, and let the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And, and you know, and, and all the things that Anonymous stands against. And, and, um, and it's, uh, like I said, it's, it's a horrifying situation, both legally and socially. And I'll, I'll um, I'll just give you, you one thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher this, I, I know. But there was this kid in Canada, in Ontario. And if you want to go back through my timeline, I tweeted the story four times because I wanted to get the full judge's quote in there. But uh, And this was sometime yesterday. But essentially what the kid was doing was swattings, mostly swattings of um, schools, you know, bomb threats, all sorts of stuff like that. And his defense was, that anonymous had got in and hacked his computer and was doing it, you know, remotely through some kind of rat or, or something like that. And he was doing this for hire, by the way. You know, people were and people were, you know, testified against him. Yeah, I paid him such and such money to call him up a bomb threat to my school and whatever. So his defense was that, um, you know, that anonymous had done it, and a Canadian judge came out and said, "No, th this isn't what anonymous does. People may disagree with their tactics." But Anonymous is a group that fights for social justice. And the idea that they would exploit, there was something about um, uh, exploiting a, a young woman and, and harassment and something like that. And the judge said the idea that Anonymous would exploit uh, a young woman and do things like that is just simply not well taken based upon the history of, of the group. Mm -hmm. So you could see how opposite <laughs> Anonymous is from the the current cultural wave that we are riding, and it's stunning and it's shocking and it's horrible and and um, it's uh, oh what times are these that we live in? Well, you know what? Here's the thing: the times that we live in are just overt times. This is gear again. We are living in the same shit. We just don't have a silver tongued lizard in the front of the podium now. We have a buffoon an orange cockwomble, if you will, <laughs> who is battling at the podium, but they're, you know, they're doing the same shady shit. They're just doing it without saying, we love you so much. You're going to be taken care of so well and everything's so great. The American government is a fucking terrorist organization, in my opinion, NSA. So there's that. Now they are overtly doing it and everybody's up in arms. Like, how could our, our government do this to us? Motherfuckers, they've been doing this to us since contact. Yeah. <laughs> I can't argue with that. You know, it's it's inter yeah, it's interesting that you said that. I'm gonna go back uh, a couple days to something I texted Barrett was that um, in every in every way, in every element, and in every sense of the definition, the Bureau of Prisons meets the definition of uh, what we call a RICO, a racketeer influenced and corrupt organization. Oh. Fuck, yes, they do. 
Absolutely. They absolutely do. And, you know, what I believe is happening is that America is getting what it basically deserves with this idiot in power because he's a reality TV show host. He's bombastic. He's uneducated. Sound familiar, guys? The base of America. I don't have any further comment to that. <laughs> I, I'm an outsider looking in. Um... No, but you aren't, though, because if we sneeze, you get a cold, and if you sneeze, we get a cold. You know, y'all started it with this Brexit shit, so I don't want to hear it. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I take responsibility for that. Uh, the Britain led, uh, Britain led the way to complete fuckery. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, might dis- I might disagree with that, having, having a Greek wife, and we go over there, we try to go over there once a year. You know, th- this wave of populism, everyone seems to forget, started in Greece with Brexit. Uh, you know, about two years before Brexit. Good point. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was you over know, we, there, we, and it was quite something. We, we forget about that because everything else has overtaken the, the news cycle, you know? But, yeah, but, but, well, the difference between Greece and, and Britain is that Greece can be pushed around. Exactly, and Troika. cannot. Uh, you, you, you got uh, your wife's uh, family and uh, relatives there uh, have had to deal with <laughs> severe, um, it, was, it was a recapitalization of the country effectively is what they tried to do. Um, and how they did it was by persecuting the poorest in the nation. Everyone that had money fucked off on their yachts to London. Effectively. True, well, to China. Really, China. you know, Greeks being being the best uh, shipbuilders in the history of the world, uh, essentially sh- sold the industry to China, and you know for for a lot of money. And most of the best shipbuilders do it over there. So yes, the rich people you know went around on their yachts. That's part of the problem. You know, it's it's it's, it's all a rich tapestry. I mean, there are a couple things we can point to. Um, you know, one is that the other is that. They surrendered, you know, when times were good and tourism was ridiculous and Greece was touted for its antiquity and never didn't need everything, anything else. Um, they, they surrendered most or all of their manufacturing to Germany, <laughs> you know, who they, you know, now owe, owe for everything they bought. There's that. <clears throat> there is the fact that in Greece, it is a national sport to treat, to cheat on your taxes. <laughs> and when you get a civil service, it really is. It truly is. Um, and, uh, and when you get a civil service commission, it's for life. So, you know, so a guy pays 10,000 euros in, in taxes and, you know, tax collector shows up at his house and out in front, you know, the, the new Mercedes and, a, and a, you know, a boat sitting in the garage and he's, you know, living in a 500,000 euro house or, or some such. And you say, well, you know, uh, doctor so-and-so, uh, how is it that you could uh, have only made enough last year to pay, you know, 10,000 10, euros in, in taxes? And you say, I have no idea. And the tax collector comes, uh, says, well, I'm going to be back tomorrow for another 10, which, of course, is going to go in the tax collector's pocket. And that's, you know, that's the way it's done. So it never trickled up to the government. Uh, that way it's and they're trying to that's that's what you know the whole troika and all of that they're trying to do and of course yeah it's breaking the backs of the middle and and lower classes and especially the pensioners now the the last thing that's interesting about Greece that no one talks about is that uh, it being such a religious country the clergy is paid by the uh, by the government and I've been told, you know, I haven't researched this, but I, I've been told by multiple people over there that the church owns 40% of the land in Greece. Wow. Yeah. That, that, I, that yeah. I didn't know. I, yeah. So I, when you put them all together, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a difficult situation. We, we've got a different scenario here in the UK in that uh, Greece, uh, sorry, Greece, religion or Christianity... Uh, is as as a massive wealth investment fund that will rival any pension fund, private or fucking government, to the tunes of billions of dollars in, in investments, and they're they're investing in weapons and tobacco. <laughs> no less. 
Anyway, bit of a side, <laughs> uh, bit of a side step there. Um, back to uh, the activism uh, aspect of uh, this conversation. The uh, do you think uh, the art of leaking um, and obtaining information is being tarnished with the current war uh, that's been ongoing between um, effectively the shadow brokers? Uh, the information group uh, and others. Uh, is this just now tit for tat uh, sharing of information without act any actual uh, goal as such? Uh, if I may, that's a tough question. I've never been able to kind of put together a, a unified theory about what the shadow brokers are actually doing. Uh, <laughs> Um, I, I like the fact that they're just dropping stuff out there. And it does appear to be legitimate that it was, you know, these were NSA tools. And I read a lot of articles about this at, at the beginning when this happened. And apparently, you know, they do that. They, they use um, third party contractors and things like that that kind of go and, and break in and, and, you know, spy on foreign governments and then just sort of leave their, you know, just don't cover their tracks, which is, you know, th that's how, that's how 14 year olds get caught. That's not how, you know, the NSA and their, and their Confederates are supposed to get caught. And a lot of people who worked for those, those types of units at the NSA agreed that that was most likely what happened. And everyone agreed that the tools that the shadow workers had were genuine. And I, I mean, I'm not thrilled that, you know, 15 billion or whatever, Windows machines are now vulnerable to just about everything, but it's it's certainly they shed a lot of light, and I, I don't think they've compromised leaking. Um, but again, I don't. They're so mercurial that it's it's hard to. I, I again, I, I just can't come up with a unified theory on them. Uh, indeed, I, I put the same question to you, Barrow. I don't know if you've been following this uh, open warfare and the uh, the nature of uh, releases of information that are occurring at the minute? I, I think it's it's too complicated to even approach a unified theory, as Jen's saying. It, it's, there's so many different individuals with different, with sometimes overlapping ideological and practical uh, ends in mind. Uh, I think it's hard to say anything that's accurate on, on that larger scale about that diverse activity. Uh, there are certain you, you can certainly sort of create a model and say, look, here are these people who who are generally suspicious of governments, and uh, you can buy them into sort of the populists and uh, the anarchists uh, and several other divisions if you'd like, and uh, try to try to you know find a common common factors, and, and you'll find some. Uh, and then you have you know, when we talk about. This, Status people with acting acting within the state. We have all these factions. Uh, you know, you have people. You know, for instance, in the U.S., you'll have Republicans who who will happily, uh, you know, they'll praise the release of information, all of WikiLeaks uh, this last election, and then come down on it as soon as they go after the CIA. Unless they don't like the CIA because Trump like this likes the CIA, in which case they're against it. You know, it's it, it's you know, it's there are a number of people with actual. Uh, principles on the matter who have a, a view of when information should be leaked and when it shouldn't. Then there are those who have some, you know, perhaps even subconscious political uh, tribalist uh, you know, sort of deep framework, fundamental framework that is going to define all of their all of their statements and all of their supposed opinions on these matters. Uh, it, it's there, there's we're in a period, I think, of, of of chaos. I don't think that's really disputed. Really, the question is how long will it last, and will it get, you know, more chaotic? Will there be more of these realignments, these bizarre sort of uh, you know, re, uh, you know, assortments within the U.S. and our domestic politics, where you have, you know, far left and far right people, uh, you know, supporting some of the same positions? That's always been the case to some extent, but you can see it more now. Uh, no, I don't think we're done. We're done with the, the reshifting. Probably things settle into some, you know, some more stable pattern in the next few years. I think they might not. They're just we're, we're in a very unusual period. They can a lot of do with the, the sudden 
uh, ability for a couple of individuals here and there to get large amounts of crucial information in, in front of the public uh, for different ends. And so long as people have the that ability, and so long that is something you drop the news cycle, you have a number of actors with incompatible uh, practices and ideology uh, taking advantage of that. It's just it's just a, a method. It's just a, it's just a tactic. What terrorism or war or anything like that? It's not a a common ideological uh, you know, setting mindset necessarily. It can be, but it usually isn't. I'll tell you what we're going to do, guys. Uh, uh, gentlemen, uh, input is absolutely fascinating. It's great listening to uh, the pair of you. Uh, I, I could listen to you both all day, but uh, we're going to go to a tune because I'm sure uh, some of us could do with a, a restroom break. Uh, we'll be back after this tune. Uh, with uh, welcome back, people. Uh, Top Gear Live and on UK Radio. Uh, we're having a fantastic conversation here, a highly informative, uh, with uh, Barrett Brown and Jay Liedman, uh, no less. Um, I've got, we've got a couple of questions for you, Barrett, if you're there. Yes, yes. Uh, let's just... Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with a personal one first. Uh, how are you personally? Forget the fight, uh, the activism aspect. Uh, how are you? Uh, and... What support did you get when you was in prison? Did you get enough letters? Was that important? Uh, did that help uh, on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, certainly, your, your, your status increases in a prison setting the more mail you get. So I was, thanks to all these uh, letters I was a friend just voicing their support and all that, I was you know, made, me, made me very popular. Um, it, in general, I mean, the most important thing anyone can do during this situation is to make sure that uh, you know, make sure that we're making the most of this raw material. Anytime the U.S. government or any, any state uh, engages in justice and engages in behavior that is contrary to what it claims to be, uh, it's it's very very it's extraordinarily important that it get uh, disseminated that, that people know about this. And that anyone can do that. Anyone can you know tweet something or send a link to a uh, journalist in their local area or or somebody they think that might be interested in writing about it. That, that is extraordinarily important to make sure that these things. Uh, are known. I mean, that, that's a doing uh, the, the, a lot. A lot of this is wrapped up in propaganda. Uh, in terms of how I'm doing, I'm, I'm, just, uh, I'm working on some projects. I have a book that's uh, decided to deal with with Farrar, uh, Strauss, and Garo, uh at least next year. It'll be about you know stuff, uh, prison stents, and then about a third of it will be in over to this process democracy as we're calling it, these, um, the pursuance system and that kind of thing. Uh, uh, you know, you know, taking the next step in activism in civic organization. Uh, but otherwise, I'm just, you know, just relaxing after my four years of uh, prison college. I'm, I'm being uh, shouted at in the chat by unknown typer to not uh, allow you to avoid the question. How are you doing? I'm fine. You know, I'm, uh, I'm just the same as usual. I mean, it's just one thing, one bizarre thing after another. That's just been the case for a long time. Uh, you get pretty, you know, things that kind of may seem dramatic on the outside, uh, you know, they become part of your life very quickly, just like any, you know, any other profession. You know, there are war correspondents who get shot at all day. That, that never happened to me. Uh, I just, my job is to, is to be subjected to injustice and then to bring it to attention and uh, cycle continues. Uh, you know, it's it's again, it, it's it's very. It, it makes it a lot easier again when when uh, it's appreciated and when you know that, that it's going towards a good cause and it's being used uh, for a larger movement. When it's being used as intellectual ammunition against those who still support states in this day and age. Uh, so again, it, every time someone you know uses this as an argument, it uses this as a data point, you know, larger conversation about where we're going and what we should do. Uh, it, it satisfied me a great deal. Can I ask you, Jay? Um, you, you deal with a lot of activists, and uh, the uh, the law comes down quite heavy on them. On the whole, how how do most activists kind of I, I don't know just manage this scenario? You got Barrett here, who's um, who adapts and is resilient, and as he quite rightly says, he's not getting shot at every day. 
So he kind of, that's how he takes comfort from what he's doing. But how do other activists uh, manage this type of situation? Well, uh, you know, obviously it varies uh, person to person. It varies ideological, um, you know, pre, uh, preset to, to ideological preset. Uh, one of the most significant variables is age. Um, you know, whether you grew up in privilege or not, and, you know, most of my clients aren't uh, people of privilege. It, you know, I, I don't, I, I mean, if they were, they could pay me something. And, and I think, you know, most of us know, I don't, I don't like to get paid on these cases. It, you know, it just feels a little dirty. Um, so you're talking with, uh, about, you know, people that are really doing this because they're the ones that are under the foot of oppression. So, you know, even though they haven't lived the greatest lives, it's prison is a jarring situation and some handle it better than others. Uh, Matthew Keyes is having a tough time because they're fucking with him mercilessly in many of the same ways, actually, that they were fucking with Barrett. Um, Matthew just doesn't have uh, as uh, as Raya wit about it <laughs> and, um, you know, doesn't 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 have a plan for the other side. Uh, by the way, we have his appellate arguments on uh, June 13th, I believe, in San Francisco. Tor Eklund's going to be taking the, the lead on that, so we'll keep everyone posted on how they go, and hopefully we'll have an opinion about his case uh, you know, from the court a couple weeks after that. But um, I digress. Um, you know, so they, they treat hackers poorly in prison. Uh, they, they think, they, they don't know what to do with them. They're very low-level uh, people that should be treated as low-level criminals, where oftentimes they're not. Um, Barrett went to a camp and then, you know, promptly uh, <laughs> got himself, uh, you know, ele elevated to, to nicer surroundings. Some of my folks went to camp. Some, you know, some went to low. Uh, a couple people went to minimum. And, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult in that, in that regard. Um, it's, it's hard when you haven't been there before and you don't, and you don't kind of plan on it and you don't think forward to it as many as the kids do. And so many of my clients are very young. In fact, I can't really think of any that were, were right now. I can't think of any that were older than their early, very early twenties when they committed their crimes. It's not something that they're used to. So it's not, pr prison's a difficult thing to just sort of, find your calm, find the eye of the storm, you know, search through it and find the eye. It's become, you know, for me, legally, you know, it's become almost fairly easy because I've been doing it so long and things are so crazy. And, you know, no, I don't get bullet shot, shot at me as well. But, you know, the stakes are, the stakes are high in, in what I'm doing. I just did this awful four week long trial in Las Vegas and you know everyone kept asking me, you know, how how are you so calm? Said, what the what the fuck else am I gonna do? What what do you want me to do? You want me to get crazy? That's not, you know, then then I won't be able to even ask a an intelligent question. That's something that I'm very encouraged you Barrett found because it's not something that a lot of people are are able to find in that situation on a first term. You know, once once you go back it's it's a little bit more familiar situation, but so I'm I'm not finding that. I'm finding that a lot of my clients are, you know, having trouble. One right now is you know has been told to get his GED, and there are portions that have to be done online, and they will not give him access even to an, a non-networked computer because I, hackers I, are the boogeyman. Sorry, I should jump in a note lest we. Uh must leave out a, a fraction of the BOP. I, I should have gone to a camp. Uh, in fact, I went to a low because, at first, because they claimed the uh, probation office, which was very much in line with the prosecution down here, claimed I didn't have a high school degree. And so I lost a few points on the uh, on your, your the, the setting they use to determine where you go. Uh, then eventually went to a medium, which I actually preferred uh, quite a bit for a number of reasons. Uh, but. Uh, you know, there's a whole point system that you use to determine your, your classification level. And in my case, you know, I had prior arrests for marijuana and probation violation when I was in person. Uh, and so that adds to my 
criminal background, etc. So uh, I went to a low at Fort Worth, which was uh, couldn't stand, and uh, luckily got there from fraction uh, and got sent to a medium. I think to do that, they had to actually make up some more stuff. And one of my intercept columns, so we had an FOIA on my files and were able to show that they had uh, made some misleading comments in order to get me sent out of there. Obviously, I, I was writing a column about that at prison, so they didn't want me there. Uh, but depending on, you know, in terms of hackers, uh, yeah, the prison system, uh, they, they have, you know, again, bank sort of pop or, uh, conceptions of what hackers are and all that. There was a number of who, who believed I was a hacker and I explained otherwise that I'm not even accused of being a hacker. I've got computer skills. But a lot of inmates will ask you, hey, can you do this? Can you go out and change my blah, blah, blah? Uh, uh, again, depending on where you are, it may work in your favor to, to be a, a hacker. Uh, among the other inmates, as far as I can tell, there were hackers who were in on sort of white collar crime over the places I was at, especially the below. Uh, you know, the, the, the prison system is is changing quite a great deal. The federal system, in particular, but uh, one thing that remains constant, as far as I can tell, is that activists uh, are going to be stepped upon by the administration uh, whenever possible. Not not just as a matter of strategy. Uh, not because necessarily they're being told to do that by the national BOP or by the DOJ or anybody else, just because they think that's expected of them. And with so many, the U.S. prison system, again, particularly the federal system, it doesn't really matter what the rules are so much as what the uh, administrators in question or the place think the rules are for what they think they should be and what they think is you know desirable by their higher up. The very haphazard. Uh, the process is very indicative of the U.S. in general. Uh, we have, you know, a great number of rules in place that could be effective in many things. We have federal laws that, uh, as someone convincingly demonstrated a few years ago in a book, you know, could be used to arrest almost any U.S. citizen. Uh, the, the threat of three, federal three felonies a day. Yeah, three felonies a day. That's what it's called. And that, that's not even counting all of the criminal, you know, all of the, uh, you know, uh, voluntary, you know, laws, you know, voluntary crimes like, you know, drugs and, the, the non the victimless crimes, uh, which you know, gambling, prostitution, and drugs, that, that could be used to incarcerate about forty million people in this country, if not more. It would be if our laws were enforced, if if the U.S. laws were actually enforced, as you know, normally and specifically, you would you would expect that laws should be uh, from the standpoint of government. We would exist as a gulag state beyond anything we see in the Soviet Union. Uh, that that says a lot about the country. And it says a lot about what the rule of law really is uh, whether or not it really exists. I, I, say, I, I say it doesn't. Uh, I think that's a bit hard to counter. Yeah, I, if I could take off from there, uh, I, I had uh, read some there that's somewhere that someone said in a, uh, an address to a, a judge during their sentencing that we're living not under the rule of law, but the rule of law enforcement, which is a pretty good line. And, and uh, yeah, that, that, that was Barry. Uh, we said that, which is a pretty good line, and, and uh, it's it stuck with me. And uh, I wanted to use what Barrett said, and then that line is a departure point uh, to tell you just a little bit about what's going on with me. And I don't know why why I didn't th- think of bringing this up earlier. Uh, I, I don't know if everyone in your audience would be familiar with the the group uh, Crackers with Attitude. Oh, so yeah. If you don't mind, I'll go into you, you know what I'm talking about. We do, yeah. Okay. I have just a, a tiny bit of, of background and there were um, two juveniles from, from sure two juveniles from London and they, they hooked up with a couple different uh, folks, one of whom is my client in uh, he was from North Carolina. They're getting prosecuted in the eastern district of Virginia, which is the harshest district in the United States. Although after, you know, kind of peripherally dealing with Dallas in the northern district of Texas. I, I may, <laughs> I may beg, uh, beg to disagree, but it's it's awful. That's where they try, you know, the terrorists and the and the big cases. Uh, that's where the the so-called rocket docket is. It's it's an awful place, and you know we we um it, it was a it, it's a bad case for us factually. One of the things we do when there are bad cases in federal court, uh, and and the offer is low at the beginning is we'll just walk in and plead the guy. They were going to, to indict him. I can't imagine the number of crimes he would have been indicted on, but we they capped it at one conspiracy, which is a five-year maximum. So, you know, if things go completely wrong, he's going to get five years as opposed to 
70 or 80. Now, when I say 70 or 80, it's because of what the conduct was. The um, young, uh, the young folks from London were able to social engineer, I, I believe it was Verizon and AOL, into password changes for the heads of the, uh, the former head of the CIA, John O'Brennan, former head of National Cyber Command, James Clapper, and the former head of the Department of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson, along with their families, along with several other people who didn't hit the press, most of whom were deputy directors for the FBI. Uh, they used a, um, if anyone's familiar with Lizard Squad, Lizard Squad had an auto dialer that would dial everyone on the hour, every hour, and, and it would start, you know, harassing, you know, saying harassing things. You can record messages and, and all of that. So it was like, you know, kids, uh, you know, the victims, the kids, the, you know, the wives, the everything were getting these calls. Everyone had to change their phone numbers. They were in the email accounts, all of that. They harvested the email accounts and they were all published on WikiLeaks. Uh, John O'Brennan had part of his, this is, by the way, again, the head of our CIA, uh, had, a, um, it, a, apparently he, even he needs to reapply for security clearances and he had his application, uh, attached to one of his emails. So whatever they said Hillary Clinton did in, uh, you know, during the election, you know, she could have grabbed her server and, and thrown it in the fire, smashed it, and that would be the end of it. This guy, the head of our CIA, had sensitive, <laughs> top, top secret uh, clearance forms on his AOL account. So not only does the head of the CIA use AOL, <laughs> by the way, but, you know, has this on there. So they hacked the shit out of them, their families, you know, uh, harassed them, all sorts of things like that. And he put to one count of conspiracy, which is a pretty, a pretty good thing. We have sentencing coming up the end of, uh, the end of, um, July, but we've had a number of things that have been task driven. And uh, well, let me actually start at the beginning. When I began to talk to uh, the client, I noticed some weird things were going on. Um, my uh, my old phone didn't it just didn't didn't work right. You know, apps were crashing. The uh, the battery was going down really really fast. Um, it almost looked like you know on a like a, a two-year-old iPhone that, that shouldn't oh. be without battery. It was going to, yeah, apparently that's a hallmark of stingrays. I didn't know that until much, much later. Um, yeah, we learned that but, at Standing uh, Rock, Jay. We learned that at Standing yeah, I, Rock real fast. I didn't know. I didn't know. But there's more to it. I mean, I, I found, I've never had, um, I, I bought a, a MacBook thinking, how, you know, how much I liked iPads and iPhones and all of that, figuring that I can, you know, being a Windows guy my whole life, I could use Apple. Well, um, so I have a MacBook with a bunch of stuff on it, you know, mostly like music and pictures, because I can't really use it for anything um, valuable. And it's never been networked, you know, kind of with anything. And it ended up, 62 um, gigs of that data ended up on my solid state drive, blocking it up, uh, on my office computer, blocking it up to the point I couldn't use it. Everything went down. Um, there were day, uh, there were like three day long periods where my iPad wouldn't um, wouldn't charge, would go to two percent and then die. Now you know whatever, right? It's not an iPad. It's it's not that big a deal unless you consider what my iPad is used for. It is used f exclusively for video games for a five year old. It's like it really fuck you, United States government. All the kid wants to do is is play a couple games. Um, but uh, it, you know when um. We have some task-driven stuff, which is where I, I kind of digress. You know, we're on, we can't talk. First of all, I was never able to install Signal on my old phone. Um, I, I was, I, I won't say any more about Signal. But, um, you know, we just, there seemed to be some wall up on either my end or his end. My, you know, my VPN keeps going down, all sorts of things. Like that, weird start happening. My computer's turned off. It's back on. I, you know, I don't fucking know. I can't prove anything. But every any time we talk, um, you know, I, I'm like, you know, I, I'm, I, I've been writing forever as a as a lawyer. I'm I'm good with, you know, grammar and sentence structure and things like that, or at least much better than I used to be. 
you know, product of the New York State uh, public school system. Um, and he's, you know, and he's young and, and, you know, people just don't, don't write as well. Um, you know, unless they come up as a writer like Barrett, they just don't, if it's not their thing, they don't write as well. So I'm having him try to just email me his thing just so I can correct like grammar and, and syntax and stuff like that. And he can't get an email to me. He, he can't get an email out and he can't, he can't fax, you know, we can't, um, you know, either way, the faxes, the faxes won't work. Um, and we can't text. I mean, we found a way to get the text like some way um, through, and I don't even want to say what it is because then that'll get blocked. But we, we found a way, a very dangerous way, and, and a very you know not preferable way to get the text through so I could scoop it up, throw it in a Word document, edit it, throw it back there. He can you know scoop it up, cut and paste it. So it's his words, but you know essentially my grammar. Um, and you know this is this is a statement that um, that is going to the to the probation office like the night before it's it's due for their for their review in, in everywhere I'm sure Barrett didn't have to do it in Texas uh, everywhere you get points for acceptance of responsibility when you plead guilty before trial um, either two or three depending upon the level in Virginia. You actually have to write up a uh, statement, like a, an allocution, like I did this and I'm sorry and whatever, to get those points. So we were doing that one night, and, and we just, that's what I've been talking about. It's like, holy fuck, we can't get an email through? Mm-hmm. Like, it, you know, I, I mean, it's just, um, so this has been going on, this has been going on with me forever. You know, I, I'm, Commander X got arrested because he was communicating with me the night before. And back in the day, I used to run my office email, like my, um, my, uh, you know, my like J at criminal dash lawyer dot me email, my GoDaddy. Uh, we used to run it through like Yahoo. Big, big mistake. That's, that's, even, that's, even, wor- that's even worse what than. What ho- did I know six years ago? That, that's even worse um, than hosting it on your own server. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Um, so you know what the fuck did I know six years ago? And we're talking back and forth, and I'm, I'm going to be there. I told him, I, you know, I took a hotel about a half an hour out. I told him I'd be there at 10 o'clock. He's like, you remember the place? I'm like, yeah, you know, I guess he had, he had told me about it a couple weeks ago. I remember, you know, the name and where it was. And in the last email, and he's using, um, like, Rise Up or something like that. You, could, you think, you don't know, but you think that they're not getting it on his end. But in the last email, the last thing, he's like, okay, I'll see you at, you know, blank cafe at 10 o'clock. And I'm like, why did you put the name in there? And sure shit, at 9 o'clock in that cafe, he got arrested. Fucking A. I can't prove anything. I, I, I mean, I don't know. Right. Could be a coincidence. But I, I don't fucking I know. I tell you what, we've done this, this little show. Like, this is not a huge show, right? We were talking to oh, Leanne it is to and me, Paul you know. DeHart. And you know what happened in the middle of the Leanne and Paul DeHart show? All of us got nuked. All of us. The show went down. None of us could get back on the internet. And my phone was irretrievable. It was gone. It was just gone. And I mean, I find that to be a very odd thing because that hasn't happened before. So, so, same, same, same with Van Darken. Um... We, we communicated uh, f- uh, with them through a, a third party country. My Skype got nuked completely. We, and the night yeah. before we did the Million Mask March 24 hour broadcast, Bad's phone got nuked. <laughs> and he could barely get it back up and running in time before we had the whole broadcast. I mean, the struggle it's, is, it's insane. The struggle is real, guys. The struggle is real. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you know what I meant to say, because what, what tipped this off in my mind is that we were talking about the new administration, and I wanted to say that this is so much worse under the new administration, because it's unabashed. Yeah. It's, there's no, uh, as bad as surveillance was under Obama, there was this like, th- there was this like, oh, you know, we're good people, we're not going to do this, you know, at least they took the trouble to lie to us, I guess is what, is what I'm saying. And, um, you know, that's not even the case anymore. It's, you know, you're talking to bad people. You're talking to hackers. You're talking to people who put, you know, the, the head of the CIA's emails on WikiLeaks. You know, you're fair game. And, uh, you know, no, that's not the way it's supposed to work. This is attorney-client privilege. And, you know, really, he's pled guilty. I mean, we're just 
pending sentencing, and we're going to file it publicly. What the? F- <laughs> what the fuck? Exactly. What in the you know? fuck? What in the holy fuck? Oh. You know, it, it I mean, frustrates me because in the '90s, when I was working with AIM, we had the same situation, but they were large and in charge and in our face. There wasn't that same type of surveillance, but there was, you know, the black cars outside my house. There was fucking wiretaps on our phones. There were people who were being hurt by big black SUVs being rammed in their driveways, shit like that. The scare tactics haven't necessarily changed, but they've become more insidious and they've become more all-encompassing because we have these devices with us most of the time, you know, so they can track where we go and what we do and who we're talking to. And it is a lot more insidious. They've been doing it forever, but it is becoming more and more insidious. And I'm seeing that even journalists, like people who don't work with anons or hackers or whatever, just basic journalists or opposition journalists are becoming targeted. They're going to open up the libel laws? How do you guys feel about that? Yeah, seriously. I'm sorry, the First Amendment's pretty important to me. Have you got a gun? Do I? Have I? (laughs) Which which one of us? Maybe. We should. We don't don't like them. Yeah, don't worry about the First Amendment. As long as as you've got a gun, the Second Amendment, you're going to be fine. But can I have both? Might need one. The other. I mean, I guess I'll have to get a gun to protect my First Amendment rights. Oh, well, at no, some point, I'm yeah. Kid, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Well, I've, I've, got, I've, I've got an interesting question from the chat um, for yourself, Jay. Um, I've got a pretty tough question for you, Barrett, as well, which I'm probably going to get your uh, legal representative uh, to uh, veto or uh, review before I ask it, but... Um, for you, Jay, what's your thoughts uh, on the illegal actions of the CIA actively hacking um, people's computers? There was a recent, a recent news article where uh, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of computers were hacked as part of a botnet scenario, and the uh, CIA had full operation of it. Where does that sit legally uh, in your mind? Well, it, I mean, it doesn't sit legally. It's it's not legal. It's, it's just... First of all, um, these were Americans that were, if I'm thinking of the right uh, incursion, these are Americans that they, that they went after predominantly, although they you know, always use the, the specter of terrorism. So it's not legal, and it's against the CIA's charter to operate, you know, operate on, on you know, American soil. Now, I guess you know, in cyberspace, you can, you, can try to, you can try to expand that argument. But... In any event, it's, you know, it's a simple answer to a, a troubling question, which is that it's just, it's flat out illegal. Um, and, you know, maybe they got a, a FISA court warrant, but I mean, those, you know, no matter what any judge says, those at some point um, will be a very embarrassing part of our history that that court was ever allowed, that a secret court was ever allowed to do secret things and had a, an almost 100% success rate. So even if they did have a warrant, and I doubt they did, it, it's it's just straight up illegal. That was my understanding as well, but that's par for the course. Um, not just the CIA or an entity on, on, on their own. Uh, I don't think it matters which um, administration is in office. Uh, the CIA's gonna fucking do what the CIA does effectively. True. Uh, I mean, we're all more worried about the NSA, who are the ones that have, you know, the best toys. Yeah, it's it's a bit of a warfare. Uh, it's a race to the bottom, <laughs> if you like. Uh, we, <laughs> we we used yeah. we use that term here in the UK uh, for uh, employment rights. It's a race to the bottom because. You want to have you. You want to be most productive. You you want to be uh, the most uh, complicit, the most powerful. So yeah, you just fuck over everyone's rights as long as your bottom line looks good. And it seems the way the uh, the way the intelligence agencies are acting at the moment, that's pretty much um, where they're going. Who's got the best toy? Who's got the biggest budget? Who can justify themselves the best? Because it's, sure. it's all about the budget at the end of the day. But that brings me on to my question to you, Bauer. Um, the 
You must have learned a lot through your court case prior to your sentencing. Um, what did you? And this is where you come in, Jay, to tell me uh, or advise what can uh, and cannot be said. Um, but what did you learn about the government investigation into you, and what advice could you give to others? Well, well we, hold, uh, so wait, hold on a sec, Barry. I, I don't. I, did you have a protective order on your on your discovery that you can recall? No, no, no. I don't. I, no, I, I don't recall that. Hammond had a big time protective order. So no, Barry can say whatever he likes. Yeah. Uh, so what we learned during the discovery phase, before uh, you know, about probably about six months after my arrest, uh, about a year and a half before my sentencing, was that the FBI had obtained several a series of search warrants uh, for me, and uh, you know, and, and for Project B and all those things, starting immediately after. Uh, our involvement in the Team Team conspiracy involved, of course, which the DOJ, uh, all the DOJ and these companies, Allinger and Andrew Gary, uh, committing these crimes against activists or plot crimes against activists and journalists. So the, the search warrants had begun after, uh, after it became clear that I uh, was involved in detention of legal activity. Government. Uh, later on, of course, the search warrant itself, the actual search warrant served on my house or on my apartment and on my mother's house as well. Uh, I think you published this on BuzzFeed shortly after the show is very clearly what they were interested in. Uh, they, they were searching for records pertaining to HP Gary, uh, in game systems, the firm that we've been, uh, that had been involved in Team Phoenix and had links to the NSA, in which we had uh, exposed some operations uh, that they've been involved in. Uh, it involved the Echelon. Dot org uh, wiki, echelon wiki, uh, project PM. Uh, and then later on, when they weren't able to find anything, either that they wanted to charge me for or want to discuss, obviously they don't go into the courtroom and start talking about HP Gary, uh, they charge me for entirely different things, the Stratford uh, deal. And then when they brought the Stratford charges, of course, uh, the linking charges because they had to, and it was something else involving Stratford, something they had never even mentioned in any of their uh, documents, uh, my, my phone call to the uh, executive of Stratford. But which uh, they decided they had that that would have to be the crime. Uh, they had to have something on me. Anyway, so we, we learned, uh, and of course, there were also applications that they made. And these aren't made public yet. I'll be going into them in my book next year and I'll be making them public. Uh, you know, they made claims to the uh, grand jury, judge, federal judges in this district about my activities. And, you know, they were false. And some were very bizarre. One of the, the, the Impetus for them getting a search warrant for my involvement with in game systems was that I had called in game systems after we had discovered the team Demas plot, after we discovered the team in game systems that had been involved in going after activists and, and you know, had been documenting my, my involvement, uh, my project PM stuff, the, uh, the building dark nets for Egyptian activists. Uh, I could say you can get a search warrant for someone who's a journalist and activist, they made a phone call to a company that's just been revealed to have been surveilling you committing crimes is rather extraordinary. That's something that, you know, people, when they, they, they lie to the judges all the time, the judges should be aware of that, but in this case, this judge, uh, there was a magistrate judge, uh, it was Stickney here in Dallas, uh, he approved that. He said, no, no nothing is fixed here. You know, they, they want us to, uh, you know, you can't leave a message, you can't talk to and you know, at a company that's been spying on you, just asking questions. And I, I recorded all those conversations. I called him and said, hey, would you like to tell me about this bizarre you know, legal plot? I, you, your, friend, your friend Aaron Barr has uh, written down stuff I've said in the chat room and written down our entirely, entirely legal, legitimate activism. Uh, that is yeah, to these judges who are not... Uh, their conduct is hard to explain, it's hard to understand, I don't really understand the mentality, but anyway, to them, that is a legitimate line of inquiry with the FBI. Another question uh, about the, uh, you work in media, uh, you're highly respected, um, uh, a lot of uh, people do respect uh, the work that you do. The, uh, the media, throughout your incarceration uh how how did they report on you is there any particular articles that you found uh, nefarious uh, was there any negative reporting on you uh or, or was it 
fair, balanced. I, I don't know. What, what's your personal take on the media uh, that's commented on your situation? The, the media, media criticism has always been my main drive. I've always been more interested in the press and information and how it flows and how it doesn't than, than anything else. It was my sort of professional interest when I, the first book I wrote. Uh, and a lot of the articles I see presented there was with me. So obviously I was very interested to see how this would play out. Uh, it took a lot of doing on the part of Kevin Gallagher, who was uh, ran my legal defense fund, the free grab round thing, all that. He had to really go out there and hold their hand through a lot of this and explain to them what was going on and point them to certain things they should be able to find themselves. Uh, and eventually, you know, the, the press was about 100% in favor of me. The case was so strong, it was so obvious the DOJ had come off to me in retaliation. Uh, and so obvious that they were committing crimes and engaging in bizarre behavior that end. Uh, the, uh, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of you, you can go back and see a lot of the problems with the press. It has nothing to do with ideology or intent or something like that. So it's been confident and lazy to a lot of reporters, including from mainstream outlets. Uh, you can see referred to as the self proclaimed spoke, spoke for anonymous dozens and dozens of times, even though I've come out very clearly that I'm not the spokesperson for anonymous. There can be no spokesperson for anonymous. Uh, I've done that over and over again on national television, on NBC News, in writings. Uh, you know, but, but someone will see that. Our journalists will see that written somewhere else and they'll just repeat it. So you can even, you can even see how that's. that's Eventually, they stopped calling me that. It took, again, it took, I had to mention my allocation. I had to make it as public as possible to ensure that the that they had to you know learn what the, what the correct answer was to that. Otherwise, I was going to make fun of them. Uh, but you can go and see how that how these things just get copied and spread. It's a real mundane aspect of, of the press coverage and press operations in this country in particular. But it's, it's very telling. People need to understand how haphazard this process is in news guys. How, uh, you know, even people who, you know, who say, oh, I don't trust the press, well, but most people actually do, they, they do trust generally what they see written in the company. And that's, and that's the next response, because most of the things down are basically true. But there's a lot of things that, like a game of telephone, that get picked up wrong and they, and they spread. And that's really, uh, that's something that, that is helpful to anyone who doesn't want the truth uh, out there. It, it's a helpful element makes the environment more easier for them, uh, for, for bad guys essentially, uh, that things get so cluttered and, and, and confused so quickly. Uh, beyond that, you know, there, there was few, early on there was only a few sort of articles that kind of, almost in the Dallas Morning News, I got Robert Polanski down here, who I think was the only journalist to take the linking charges seriously. Uh, and then eventually, again, that's the other element. When, when they see that everyone else has taken a stance on something, uh, they're less likely to do that. So once it becomes accepted you know, among the mainstream press that the Lincoln charges are bullshit and they're not being persecuted, then it'll be repeated more often. It just it, You really see a lot of these mundane day-to-day factors that shape not just how our press works, but how our, uh, you know, our, our citizenship works, how our, how our focus works. It, it's all kind of, it, it's all dependent on this very, uh, very loose, very, very, uh, have had procedures, uh, and, and that's unfortunate. You know, I, I didn't. Uh, I went to college very briefly and quick because I was already had only had writing jobs, so I didn't go to journalism school. But a lot of the people who did, uh, you know, they did not learn the things they really need to learn, which really can't be taught about risks, about about uh, you know, uh, understanding what is and isn't important. So uh, you know, there, there's also a lot of you know. What we're up against, whenever we try to bring out information, even you know the, the hacking and the leaking, that's often the easy part. The hard part is getting people to understand what has been brought out, and uh, we've seen over and over again failures uh, on that. We've seen when Strap first came out. Uh, you know, after all these people had done so much, taken so much risk, and suffered so much to bring emails out, you had an article in the Atlantic Monthly by some some guy saying, "Oh, this, you know, they, they say that Strap is the shadow CIA, and they're not." Blah blah. And they're taking Stratford seriously. Well, no, no one was taking Stratford seriously in that regard. USA Today had referred to Stratford as the shadow of CIA. And that went on with WikiLeaks or Wikipedia, and then journalists who report the Stratford hack they go to Wikipedia and they repeat that. Uh, WikiLeaks I mean, and uh, doing this, uh, Jeremy Hamm and uh, I, people involved in Project uh, IRC, where a lot of that discussion was being played out after the hack. And then no one was saying this is the shadow CIA. What we were saying was, and as, as 
borne out very quickly, even by the first revelations from those emails, is that Stratford is a company that's very indicative of how the U.S. works because it is led by former government officials who work informally with law enforcement officials against U.S. citizens they don't like. That's Stratford. So, again, so much of this, so much of the coverage we have to help shape it. We have to make sure that it's easy for them to understand what's going on because they won't get it themselves. That's just a sad fact of modern American life. That's why over the next 10 to 15 years there has to be more thought by activists on how to better manage the information situation. How do we more rigorously ensure that everyone knows those things that have been brought out? How do we make sure that information, once it's been gotten out there, is actually used properly? That's a huge task. It's a huge part of our job, and it's one of the first things we have to look at if we're going to actually see some advances in the next decade. Well, that's a very pertinent point. That's the thing with the Snowden release, with the amount of documents that were reportedly to be in possession of Glenn Greenwald and those at The Guardian, which were subsequently destroyed. And also the Panama Papers, reportedly at the time to be the largest release of information ever. Do you think these leaks are being maximized and do... yeah what happened to those by the way those disappeared from the news top yeah uh, th- there's ongoing governmental investigations but it's the same government tax uh departments that allowed it to happen in the first place uh so when you have a leak of a large a large data set, whether it be 70,000 emails from H.P. Gary or 5 million from Stratford or all these other uh, larger leaks in the last couple of years, and with the leaks of recent CIA uh, release, uh, you have a number of strategic sort of, or really tactical issues you have to, you have to uh, decide on, you know, one of which is what's, how do you maximize the impact? It, it's all well and good to have a huge leak with huge numbers of documents, but it will go to almost nothing unless you, you know how to best take advantage of it. And that usually involves, uh, first of all, explaining that we're releasing these this in staggered groups. We're going to release these first, and with some explanation as to it. That's what WikiLeaks is doing that now. We let you know release uh, you know new pages, explain here's some highlights, here's what it means, here's some background, here are the broad emails. You don't release everything at once. You don't dump it out uh, unless, like, with the case of H.P. Gary. There are 70,000 emails. The hackers made the decision to release those uh, immediately, and uh, luckily we had enough. Uh, we had enough uh, sort of people looking at it, uh, both in the establishment press and, and among us, independent researchers, that you know some things did come out that were very important and that helped to drive uh, the next year of some scrutiny. Um, but crowdsourcing plays a huge role in this. You know, with H.P. Gary, the emails. You know, there was an informal, but even before the Project PM got started with it, there was an informal effort among a number of people to look through these emails, document it sort of in a systematic fashion, and, and present that information. And that's what, you know, Project PM eventually sort of codified that, you know, made it more rigorous. You know, I had a site just for that, you know, just for these things. Uh, it, uh, with these leaks, we have to have crowdsourced. We have to have a very, uh, if not regimented, if not sort of, uh, systematic, we have to have a large scale effort to document what's in there. In the meantime, we have to explain to the press over and over again, you know, this is just part of it. There's still there needs to be looking at it. H.P. Gary, he had, you know, had major stories about T. Phoenix, you had things that Congress brought up. Uh, there was no investigation, and the congressman had the relevant committee shot that investigation down, but it, it, a huge story. Uh, you know, the New York Times, I, I spoke to them the day after the act and said, hey, look, email. You, know, you can look into these. It's very indicative of this. It's a very opaque industry. And the guy told me he just covered us. You know, something else where we bore. He said, uh, "Oh, I don't think it's a New York Times story." And then, of course, a few weeks later, after the real work had been done, New York Times did write about it, just explaining what all the real journalists had done. So uh, there, there, there's a there's a multifaceted effort of, of making sure the press understands what this is and what it means and why they should be looking into it. And, and we had some success in that. We got Bloomberg Business Week. I had actually had some very good journalists over there. We got them to look at the end game systems after I found some emails in which they're talking amongst themselves and saying, oh, no one will ever know what we're doing. You know, if this ever gets out, you know, we're finished, our NSA clients, blah, blah, blah. 
I was able to those emails to an editor there, and they, you know, three, few months later, one of their good investigative journalists did a whole long piece on what they were doing, and uh, probably disrupted their operation to some extent. So there's a lot of lessons that we've learned from abroad. Some of them are very specific and nuanced, and kind of you know, sort of uh, shop talk kind of things that that have, to, you know, there's science to this and, and art. We have we have to understand the science of it and the art of it, and we have to be conscious of the environment in which we're working. The very haphazard. Uh, you know, best environment in which so many really just incompetent journalists who should not be journalists are out there, you know, responsible you know, in us, the eyes of the years of this republic, uh, have, have their hands held in the process. Um, Gal, uh, you just linked me to uh, something because we're, we're talking about the uh, the importance and relevance of link uh, leaks and the uh, the amount of information that's reported to be leaked compared to the information that we're actually known about. Um, Gal, you just posted uh, an important link and. Uh, regarding the Panama Papers, uh, there's reports being released on quite a regular basis, am I right? Every day. Every day there's a new news story on the Panama Papers, and there has been for over a year. I get, um, I get notifications every time there's a new story printed. It just, just seems like they just went away. I mean, I know that you know, if you're looking for them, they're there, but it was a big splash in the media, as it always is, and then it fizzled away, except in Iceland. Well, that's, that's and Malta. Malta has called called a snap elections over the the Panama paper leaks from less oh, than seven really? years ago. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There you go. Breaking news. Uh, is it, it's not fake news, Gal? Is it? No, it's not. It's, <laughs> it's on the Panama Papers site <laughs> and all over Malta. Um, it's not. Oh fuck! What now? News is it? <laughs> but yeah, probably is that. But, but my question is, the public appetite for when. This type of story breaks; it dwindles quite fast. Uh, is uh, the interest, and that's why it kind of dips off the radar. Twenty-four hour news source. That's what's happened. Except now it's about a six-hour news source. Actually, <laughs> that's, that's that's the chief factor that all of editors and producers are looking at. You know, that, that it's not a is this an interest for you on this? It's oh, that's that didn't that happen a long time ago? Isn't you know we need something new unless there's an event. Well, and then it's made headline. That's just one of those things that, that, that defines so much of uh, how the press works and how uh, democracy works. It, it, it's these, these very, uh, you know, this very uh, short-sighted and non-robust uh, procedure for determining what's what's new according to an editor. And that's, you know, that's going to always up against no matter how much data is in those Panama papers. No matter, you know, and of course, there, like I said, there have been stories on it, but Probably not. The, the public in this country, in particular, and the press, has an attention span problem. And a lot of that has to do with sort of working to live or sort of mercenary outlook on what their job is. Uh, you know, producers and editors are uh, worse and more deleterious uh, to our free society than any particular intelligence agency in, in terms of how much, uh, how much they make possible. Or, or states to, to act, uh, you know, behind the scenes, just by virtue of their, their, you know, just their mentality. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're heading towards the end of uh, the broadcast, uh, gentlemen, and uh, I'm I'm going to lighten it up a bit if if I if I can. Um, Barrett, now I don't know how many times you said it, but you was not the spokesperson of Anonymous. Uh, but the judge still stated that you were the spokesperson of Anonymous. How do you feel about that? Well, the judge, again, there's a number of things that we made clear uh, in a series of, uh, of um, papers we submitted to the court, you know, in, in the course of uh, trying to get the targets dropped, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and this judge in particular, like a lot of judges, uh, also has an attention span problem. And sort of said, un unable to retain information. Uh, that was not the only thing he said that we had already uh, shown to be otherwise. It, it happened several times in this case. It has a lot to do with that individual judge, but it also has to do with you know the difficulties that arise in a, in a court system where uh, the FBI can throw all these claims out and just make see what sticks. And you know, even when you shoot them down, uh, it doesn't make an impression on a judge. You just think, wow, they just made a lot of claims, a lot of things that are false. They, they so to be not true, and then you know, and then the government hasn't explained you know how they made those errors. I, 
I should probably stop listening to it or at least demand evidence on all my future uh, claims. That's just not how it works, and that's one of the big mysteries to me. I really don't, I, you know, generally I can kind of put myself in the head of, of, of people, uh, my enemies and, and all that, but in, in the case of uh, judges, I really don't understand the, the, the process there. It's it just very, it's very, very bizarre. Jay, can I can I bring you into this? Because when a judge makes that um, uh, statement, that that's opinion over fact, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, if I, you know, um, I, I've been doing this a long time. I don't think I have any greater insight into judges than <laughs> than Barrett does. There, um, you know, I, I don't. They they do what they're going to do. Uh, I'll say a couple things by way of explanation. Uh, first is that um, in sentencing, in sentencing hearings, the the, the information, the, the scope of the type of things they can say, they can rely on, and all of that is very broad, and it's not really tied as well to the factual issues that would be presented in a trial. It's it's almost a. I mean, it's not a whole different thing. But it, it's it's so much broader that it sometimes it, it appears that way. So so that's on column A. Column B is is, is much worse. And column B is that you know you wonder to what extent these judges read sentencing submissions. And I don't know. Um, you know Barrett had uh, two two fine attorneys that ended up uh, handling the criminal case. And I, I don't know what they did in terms of a sentencing submission. What they you know, what they put before the court in terms of legal argument and, and um, you know, reasons to sentence downward, depart, what we call Booker variances, things, things like that. But, you know, it's happened to me more than once or twice or three times in my career that I've caught a judge up on the bench having not, having clearly not read my papers. And, and one of the things, you know, that I kind of, I, I seem to excel at is is humanizing my client in a way that a court can understand. And I take a lot of time on sentencing because you know, uh, I you know if you don't get a dismissal, you know ninety seven percent of cases don't go to trial. So if you can't get your case dismissed, it's likely going to settle. And if you can do better for someone, you damn well better do better for someone. And if the judge is up there with his mind already made up, which uh, you know. Lindsay clearly was, um, you know, they don't read the papers, they don't understand the facts, and they don't, they, they just don't get it right, which means, by the way, they don't get the sentence right either. And, um, you know, one of the things you do when you, when you take a federal plea is you waive your right to appeal. And you could appeal sentencing error, but what are you really going to get on a factual mistake? statement like that. It's just um, it's just one of those things that's not going to get you a lot of mileage. But it's infuriating because it goes to the it goes to the heart of sentencing, which isn't is that you know you, you're supposed to consider the offense and the offender. And really it's it's what we call it's policy sentencing. You know, if you've done something like this, you kind of fit into this box, you're gonna get right around this sentence no matter what you say or do. And it's shitty. Anyway on to the next question <laughs> last and final question and it's a, it is a legal one is uh, how can judges be allowed to rule on something that they don't rightly understand it, you mean like like technology Te yeah. and these <laughs> and these you know um, well gosh uh, you know how, how can Congress make laws when they don't when they don't understand it you know uh, as, as I've pointed out over and over again, you know, our our Senate and, and House of Representatives are what? Overwhelmingly 60, 70, 80 year old white guys, a, a lot of which don't Le use the email. Just, I believe, I, I, believe <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's funny, but it's like, I believe the uh, Chief Justice of our Supreme Court does not, does not use email. And, um, you know, how are they going to, you know, doing sophisticated cyber law? writing sophisticated cyber law, or at least introducing it and arguing it, if they don't, you know, if they can't even use email. So, oh, gee, you know, they have staff. Yeah. They have right. staff to read their bills. They have staff to explain the internet you know, to them. I, I get that. 
But that, that no, that's that's brings me like around to answering the question. Answer that, that I've well, been yeah. hearing last week. I have staff. Well, okay. Yeah, I, no, Sorry I, I get it. Just, it. No, I get it. I know the healthcare debate's been ridiculous, and everyone admitted to not reading the bill. I, I get you. But transcribe that to this too, I think. Oh, uh, that I that I hadn't I hadn't heard. But I don't know. Um, since November, I've been unable to watch the news. Basically, what I know is what I, I have like every news app there is, and it just pops up on my iPhone. I do the pop ups. I can't I can't even watch the Daily Show anymore, which is something I used to really enjoy. But in any Jay, event, you I and I have something in common there. I just yeah. want to know. It's not um, just I, you. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to directly answer uh, Top's question before you know before we shoved off, which is this. Uh, your job as an attorney, when you come into a case, whatever case it is, is to educate the judge. And if the ju- even if it's something that the judge has seen a million times, you know, a, a possession of coke or meth or whatever, um, there's always something new or changing that you can find if you work harder, if you work smarter to educate them. And on a case that involves technology, you really have to break it down. And there's, um, you know, there, there's... Uh, Things that I do, I mean, I, I take, you know, I'm, I do a lot of long briefs and some of them, you know, I will, I will take from like, uh, you know, the How Things Work website and the really simple explanation of what is a VPN, what is Tor, because these things are scary to a judge. They don't know, they don't know what they are. They, they think there's some kind of, whoa, right, if you're doing that, you know, obviously you're hacking the NSA. You've got something, you've got something to hide. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what you. So that's that's essentially the answer to your question. Is it's your job to educate the judge. Some of them are good with it. Um, some of them are not so good with it, and uh, some of them are Sam Lindsay. Is there any sort of public outcry besides from the uh, hacker community and from people who understand how computers work, the IT community? Is there any other public outcry about? these draconian laws being implemented by judges who don't quite understand how technology works, or is it just kind of American apathy at its finest? Can I, can well, I, no, no, there, there's a, oh, I'm sorry, there, there's a genuine outcry among the rest of the populace that, that's diverse from the, the tech populace. However, the outcry is not to change these draconian laws, it is to make them more draconian. Because if you use the H-word, hacker, you know, Boy, they, they need to you know they need to put them under the prison and, and not yeah. not in a cell. They need to bury them under the prison and then build a new prison on top of the prison just to make sure it pushes down on them. And that and that's the way we are because uh, you know our our um, our, uh, our community you know we are an activists. We're we're cyber terrorists in the view of the the you know normal average what whatever person and it's um and, and uh you know unfortunately that's what happened to barrett and it cost him years of his life just you know just just for investigating and i think barrett's case was you know one of the most egregious to be honest because it was like he's a journalist he's investigating this and and as a journalist for me it was it was just appalling that we can't even report on things that are happening that are affecting our country in ways that need to be exposed. That is the that is the job of a good journalist is to expose things like this. And wow. now we're, we're silencing our journalists. I mean, it's just it fucking boggles my mind. Well, it doesn't, but I mean, it it angers me. There was a degree of uh, of you know outrage, uh, you know, among an actual like you know mainstream outlets like U.S. News Report, uh, Time Magazine, you know, after my. Study. Uh, it, by that point, it didn't make sense what was going on. It was very obvious to anyone who looked, even someone with a little background on these issues, that this was, that there was something wrong here. So that, that's good, and, that, and that's important, because that's what this is all about. That's, that's the most to do in this process, is to make sure that the DOJ and, and the government uh, make sure their position is put in very stark relief and it's shown to be what it is. Uh, you know, in my case, you know, even aside from the issues of journalism, you know, I, I was an activist, and I was very vocal about my uh, my opposition to, to the state. Uh, I, you know, I, I want this to be more about you know press. Freedoms. The press freedom thing is important. Uh, I think that journalists, when they eventually, when things cross a certain line, they'll be able to defend themselves. But 
what's most important to make is, is establishing the rights that when you have been attacked, when you have been subject to crime by state actors and corporations who, who are working with the state, like the intelligence contractors, who in many cases, again, had planned crimes against activists, had perpetrated crimes against me in the, after I began uh, my work exposing them, uh, that you have the right to defend yourself. You have the right to go after them, investigate, call them up uh, without, you know, the, if, if they're applying all these laws only to us and they're, and they're letting these companies do these same things that, that would, would be considered crimes if anonymous did them, then we don't have the rule of law. And that's the most important thing to me uh, making this case. It's not, it's not an issue that comes up very often, but it's something that, that needs to come up. It's uh, over the next few years, especially uh, as the situation deteriorates, it's going to be very important to establish a doctrine of enhanced civil disobedience, as in when we have provided clear evidence of government criminality, and when we have shown that there is a systematic uh, defense of these criminals by the government itself, then, then we have the right and the obligation to fight back. And that's what I want to get across most, because that's what's going to be necessary. We're not going to win this battle by just by making the case. The case is important. The case precedes everything. But, you know, society as cowardly as ours, uh, you know, people are different now than they were 50 years ago. They thought they're, they're different. Come a long way in some ways, but the, the average person, the average uh, American, is not as courageous uh, as they once were. Uh, so what I want to do is, is try to take my right example, say, look, this is the things we have to do. These are things that you have, you have to consider. You know, what your role is in this society, what your role is as a citizen, and what your duties are, and to what do they extend? Do they, do they just limit you to, to making your voice heard and, and tweeting and, and pressing opposition, or are you going to actually take steps? Uh, to diminish the level of criminality and injustice that's being perpetrated around the world by our governments and by their partner corporations. That's, that's the main theme here, uh, even beyond the, the, the press uh, issues, which again are important to have been emphasized. Uh, and I think that I, I bring that up because I've always been a huge proponent of the First Amendment. I think that's what got me into activism in the, in the first place. And I see that the First Amendment applies to certain people and it doesn't apply to others. And at that basic injustice kind of propelled me into my life a thousand years ago because I'm old as fuck. So I've seen it deteriorate over time more and more and more. And I felt like we were going to get to this point in our country where journalists who were also activists like myself we're going to be targeted and, and things just are, are really going down a slippery slope. But now we're okay with, with people like Betsy DeVos, who's the brother of the Blackwater man, Eric, whatever the fuck, Eric DeVos, I guess, right? No. Prince. Eric Frank. Yeah. Uh, he basically bought her appointment and he's been reported to be doing some real shady shit just in the campaign. So, we're all just kind of like, that's been swept to the sideline. That alone should be like a topic of conversation. Blackwater is involved in picking the Department of Education's secretary. And that's, that's something that is really blatant. And like I said before, they've done this shit before, but they did it in back channels. They did it in a way where it was muddied and we didn't see it. And now it's just right out there and people are like, well... Trump knows what he's doing because he says what he means and he means what he says. And I'm just like, how can you not see these clear lines drawn to these really bad actors? I mean, I don't understand how, well, I do understand it, but it's we, just, we, we it's, are, we, it's, gear, we are led by the least amongst us. Well, duh, we always have been, you know, like the old adage is you run a company, you're not a smart man. Generally speaking, the CEO is not the brightest. Yeah, anyway, I just, um, I appreciate the conversation a whole lot, and I'm just, the more that I watch the things going, and you guys are all young, and I'm watching all of you fighting so hard, and we've been doing this for so long, but the most important thing is to not ever, ever give it up. Just change your tactics. Move in different ways, I guess. Diversify. Yeah, di diversify your portfolio of activism, my friend. <laughs>
Um, I lied. I have one further question, and I, I will let you guys go. Barrett, um, on a personal note, uh, what's the biggest single change uh, that you noticed from before you was in prison uh, to when you was released? It could be anything globally. Just, just what was the biggest change that you noticed? I think there's there's less confidence in the press. I think they have, uh, you know, there was a superficial reason for, for you know people to, to mock the press after the election because oh they got these things wrong and that's that's all well good. But more to the point, you know, there was an attempt by the Washington Post to get their hands around this whole fake news idea. And of course, they they had this site, prop or not, that they said, oh, this is the site that will tell you blah 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 blah, and it turned out to be wrong. So that's you know that that's just an example of what's happened is that. I think that there's always not there's always been something about all the press and other things the press is ideologically this way or it's come by the book or whatever. It's more it's more complicated that more to the point I think perhaps there's more mission that the press is a haphazard entity and it is not uh, it's not one way or the other, it's not one people think it's just it's this conglomeration of, of um, you know, that the one hand is not what the other is doing. It's it's not a uh, monolithic thing where there's one particular problem. It has a lot to do with the confidence, it has a lot to do with the industry and sort of the shape faces the short the force to shape that. Uh, I think that's that's not maybe the biggest change, but I think it's the most potentially important and, and perhaps even uh, productive change is that maybe from there we can perhaps make a great argument that we need new press entities. We need we need to look at, uh, at other means of journalism, you know, crowdsourcing that kind of thing, uh, involved with setting up structures. You know, we haven't really redesigned how we do journalism uh, to to accommodate these new possibilities allowed for the internet. Uh, again, we're still in very early days. Uh, there will be a great number of new inventions and, and procedures uh, created you know, in the next year by which we'll be better able to assess information, and better able to act on it, and you know, that's that's I think the most fruitful area of exploration is, is to determine, you know, how do we get to make sure this information when it gets out stays out? How do we ensure that it does something? Uh, what is what has worked in the past few years? What what examples have looked at that, that made sense and it kind of had a, a positive effect and how can we replicate that? Uh, that's you know, that that's what I'm looking at. That's what I think everyone should be looking at. Uh, I second that. Um... Again, uh, I started off the show uh, congratulating you, Barrett, on your second release. Uh, I'd like to finish the show congratulating you on uh, you, the future that's about to uh, uh, you're about to embark on. It's it's, it's going to be varied and interesting for sure. It will be. Uh, not what I've done so far is not what I will be remembered for. Uh, if I'm remembered for anything, it will be for creating this this mechanism, this pursuance system. Uh, we there, there's a great potential uh, right now. Uh, people in this country, in particular, uh, are now more receptive to the argument that it's time for a fundamental radical change, and that that can be accomplished. We just have to show them it's a small steps what can be done, and uh, when that's more widely understood, when that's more widely described to them, these things are possible. Uh, then we'll see a, a huge uh, sea change in how people uh, perceive themselves and their governments. Their citizenship, and uh, we're going to have a, they got a period of tumult and have a period of conflict. The nation state's not going away, fascism, authoritarianism are not going away. But there is now a viable alternative, not something utopian, not something that oh, everyone did this, but something where we can take step by step uh, actions that will serve as a catalyst for further action. And uh, we'll be presenting this a little bit more formally, this pursuant system, uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, it's something that will be you know, building up over the next year, and it will be out by next year by the time I release my book. But it's something I hope if you, anyone who's involved in Anonymous, anyone who would have been involved in Anonymous, were they not concerned over certain aspects of it, anyone who's just given up on the institutions, uh, this is a way to combat those institutions, to fix them when necessary, in some cases, I think, perhaps to uh, diminish them. So I hope that people will pay attention as we present that case further. Uh, we, we will be sharing uh, as and when uh, you produce uh, any information for sure. Um, and I, I, before, before we take off, I wanted to ask Barrett one more question. It's kind of a pedestrian question. You're, since this uh, re-arrest and then subsequent release, 
are, are you able to continue your writing, you know, and, and all of your, your essays and whatnot? Are we going to expect to see more of that in the coming near future before the book comes out? Yes, yes, the DOP hasn't expected to finish that at all. They backed off the original claim that I need permission to interview and stuff and do that. You know, immediately start doing interviews, including one with PBS on Friday. It'll be available a month from now. Uh, you know, they, they, you know, I've, I've made a point by going to jail and making a big scene about it. Uh, no, I'll, I'll have a DCD magazine. I'll be writing. They, they got that big law firm for me in New York on this most recent thing, so I'm going to write another uh, Barrett Brown review about the letters in jail. Fantastic. And, and then uh, I have a column due for Intercept at some point. Uh, I'll be resuming those. Uh, it'll be, you know, about uh, other things aside from prison. I'm done with the prison issue. Nothing, uh, you know, nothing bothers me. Can't complain of that. But uh, I'll, I'll be. Good man. Fantastic. Never stop. Uh, Jay, uh, thank you so much uh, taking on Barrett Brown. You got his back. Uh, that's appreciated amongst uh, activist circles. Uh, we knew you was the guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll do. I'll do what I can. Um, I'll do what I can. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on here. Uh, you know, Always. by the power. Fight the power. Come back soon, Jay. We'd love to talk to you about any other cases you got going on in the Anon world. You know that Anytime. anything you can, you know. <laughs> Anytime. Thanks, uh, guys. Barrett, thank you for taking time out uh, of your day. Uh, I'm glad we finally got to speak with you. Uh, it really was a privilege and an honor, mate. Thank you. Thanks for doing the photo. Uh, Best fortune in all of your endeavours to the pair of you, gents. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to a couple of tunes now. Uh, this is We're going to conclude this broadcast. Uh, this has been Anon UK, Top Gear Live. Uh, we're back next Sunday. What's happening next Sunday, we don't know. We have no fucking clue. We don't plan. <laughs> we don't plan. We're anarchists. <laughs> There's no planning. We'll figure it out later. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, yeah. Uh, just follow Anon UK Radio shows every day. Do not miss out uh, music, news, and chat. Uh, all you need. Uh, yeah, congratulations, people! You've just listened to probably one of the most informative shows on radio. You don't get that.